All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, taking the time to be with us today. Uh, my name is Arnold Smith. I'm the CEO of the New West Chamber of Commerce. Um, got a great uh, a virtual presentation today about really understanding your responsibilities as it relates to COVID-19 um, as an employee or a place of business. Uh, I've got a poll going right now, which just uh, touches in on um, uh, kind of the consumer activities that you're comfortable resuming. So if you can take a moment to do that, that'd be great. We've, as I've said, we've launched this poll a few times, so it's really interesting to see the evolution of the responses. So we'll just give another couple of seconds for people to respond. Um, I had to clear the results once, so if you uh, did respond once, but you haven't had a chance, then you can go ahead and do it again. Otherwise, I'm gonna end the polling in about eight seconds. Uh, I'm really excited about our guest speakers today, or our, our, our experts, if you will. Uh, Trudy Rondu from uh, WorkSafe BC is a senior manager. Uh, and Jyoti Dhaliwal, I'll be introducing them more formally uh, uh, soon, but Jyoti is from uh, the new Westminster firm, law firm uh, Cassidy and Company. So um, yeah, ending the polling now, I'll just show, share the results. And so uh, interesting, so dining in at a restaurant or pub is still very low, only 38% out of the uh, eight respondents are comfortable with that. A little more for um, dining on a patio, so almost a double. Um, takeout, uh, uh, still uh, the vast majority are okay with that. In-person retail shopping, you know, two thirds. Uh, personal care services, attending small events. This is one that's really of particular interest to me as a chamber is, uh, you know, very few people are really comfortable going to indoor events. Um, and the last one, attending small gatherings outdoors. So you get a big chunk, but still, uh, people are really reluctant to get together, and, I, and that obviously follows the guidelines of what we're being instructed to do. Um, but as an organization who, um, you know, a big part of what we do is events, really trying to understand, you know, when is the right time to do in-person events again. Uh, so this kind of uh, straw polling helps me. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing the results, and I'm just going to share my screen um, and go with um, uh, just the kind of a little presentation that I've got for you all here. Uh, play that. Um, okay, so uh, this is part of our business leader discussion series, um, and uh, the purpose of this is really to help business owners and organizational leaders to understand their responsibilities as related to COVID-19. I see the purpose uh, for this event is to really lessen the anxiety for business owners uh, about their potential liability related to COVID-19 by helping them A, understand their obligations, uh, B, understand the complaint process, and C, understand how to prepare to respond to any potential complaints they receive. Easy for me to say. Um, the, the impetus behind this really came from a headline that I saw back in June, uh, which really took me, um, you know, made me uh, take notice. And, and uh, that said, Dr. Bonnie had said after a business, um, uh, you know, some, um, uh, workers and um, uh, customers got infected out of business that uh, businesses may be legally liable if customers or workers become infected if it is determined they did not adhere to mandated safety precautions. And I know that I got a lot of feedback uh, from our members and from the, the people in the public who said like, what is my responsibility? What is the potential liability? I wanted to understand that. And so that was the reason why I put together this event to hopefully lessen the anxiety for the people out there. Um, I just wanna say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, these uh, help us to do these events for free. The City of New Westminster, uh, the New Westminster Record helps us promote these. Uh, featured sponsor, the Port of Vancouver, um, they've helped us out with a big um, a sponsorship, so thanks to them. And also our supporting sponsors, um, the Chambers uh, Group of Benefits Plan, uh, Waddington Wealth Management, and Lauren Nanke. So thank you to all of them for, uh, for their support. I um, also want to just give a shout out to Connections. Uh, we have Nimi here, and she is really your free recruiter. Uh, this was a, a, a program that the New West Chamber pioneered, which is really in, uh, a partnership with WorkBC to help employers find, um, find employees and vice versa, if you're, uh, you're looking for work, you can go to Nimi and she might help you find work. So uh, go ahead and check out uh, Nimi at FraserWorks or um, um, go to our website and you can connect with her there. Um, I wanna talk about just quickly our upcoming events. We are uh, continuing with our digital marketing series and the next three are all about free traffic, which is really great for your business. Paid traffic is one thing, but that costs you money. But when you can bring, add people to your sales funnel without 
uh, spending any money. That's the big thing. So we're starting with SEO. Then we're doing the harnessing the power of video and then social media content strategies to get free traffic. Uh, for our, our local business leaders discussion series, we've got a few topics coming up. Uh, those are the dates, uh, the 26th, the 9th, and the 23rd. Second wave preparations, uh, business and the overdose crisis, and also mental health. Now, I'm so excited that um, we got uh, Trudy Rondu uh, to be here to speak with us today. Uh, she's a senior manager of prevention services for RookSafe BC. Um, uh, as a senior manager in prevention programs and performance at WorkSafe BC, she spent the last decade working with numerous industry and labor groups to reduce workplace injuries and improve return to work outcomes. Over the last five years, Trudy's focus has expanded to include workplace mental health. She currently serves as chair of BC's First Responders Mental Health Committee, and Trudy speaks at conferences and gatherings around the province on new and young worker safety, health and safety management system, promoting positive mental health in the workplace, and most recently, Trudy has been working on consulting with various industry stakeholders in the development of protocols to help with the resumption of business during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are super stoked to have her be here to answer your questions and do a short presentation for us. We also have um, Jyoti Dollywal, who not only is a member of our board at the chamber, but a, a lawyer, a local lawyer here at Cassidy and Company. Uh, her primary experience is representing plaintiffs in personal injury cases and representing clients in debt collection, shareholder disputes, and contract disputes. She's fluent in English and Punjabi and has appeared in provincial and Supreme Court. So if a member of the public were to bring a complaint forward uh, about getting infected at your place of business, it would fall under the personal injury. And so that's why she's here to talk to it from that perspective. That's a lot of me, and I'm really thankful that um, it'll be less of me moving forward. Uh, so I'm just going to go over here, uh, just quickly agenda. First, Trudy is going to do a presentation. Then we're going to go into a discussion about what the complaint process would look like from if a member of the public got infected, and then just go into an open discussion of questions and answers. So now we're over to Trudy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to her. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and write them in the chat and uh, uh, just we can collect them and we can make sure that we can get to them at the end of the presentation. All right, thankfully, over to Trudy. Um, once again, thank you so much for being here uh, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing uh, what you have to say. Great, thank you very much. And uh, I'm assuming that everybody can see my screen now? Looks good to me. Okay, perfect, great. So um, I'll get started and I think the key message that I want to to everyone here is that WorkSafe BC, particularly as it relates to COVID-19, has been working in a consultative and educative capacity with employers. You know, this is something new for all of us. And so we've really taken this approach of, of consultation and, and working with employers. So my presentation today is going to talk a little bit about who we are, um, what some of the health and safety responsibilities are for both employers and workers how to develop a COVID-19 safety plan. And I'll run through that quite quickly, but there are a lot more resources available on the WorkSafe BC website if you're interested in, in completing one of those safety plans. How to control the risk of COVID-19 exposure in the workplace. I'm gonna to quickly touch on some of the industry protocols that have been developed, and then talk about really what to expect from the prevention department at WorkSafe BC. A little bit of information on WorkSafe BC support and other resources, and then obviously we'll move over to questions and answers. So I think in terms of the who are we, not everybody has an understanding of the role that WorkSafe BC plays in the province. So we were established by a provincial legislation as an agency with the mandate to oversee a no fault insurance system. So what that means really is you can't sue uh, your employer for an injury. It's a no fault insurance system, unlike many of the insurance systems in the different states in the US. Um, in BC, it's a no fault insurance system. So we partner with employers and workers in BC to promote the prevention of workplace injury, illness and disease, rehabilitate those who are injured and provide timely work return to work, provide fair compensation to replace workers' loss of wages while they're recovering from injuries, and ensure the sound financial management for a viable workers' compensation system. In particular, the, uh, the WorkSafe BC is governed by the Act and Section 17 of the Act outlines the fact that in accordance with the purposes of the occupational health and safety provisions, the board has the mandate to be concerned with occupational health and safety generally. So I just wanted to emphasize that it's really around workplace health and safety. 
and with the maintenance of reasonable standards for the protection of the health and safety of workers in British Columbia and the occupational environment in which they work. So really, WorkSafe BC is focusing on establishing standards and requirements for the protection of the health and safety of workers and the occupational environment. And in that context, we undertake inspections, investigations, and inquiries, and we provide a number of services. So I really wanted to make that distinction because we also have pu the public health system in BC. And in particular, with COVID-19, there has been a lot of overlap of the two different organizations and, and really a lot of collaboration and working together. So WorkSafe BC is responsible for the, the workplace and the worker and the employer health and safety, whereas public health is responsible for the public health. So it provides independent advice to the ministers and public officials on public health issues, monitoring the health of the population of British Columbia, recommending actions to improve health and wellness, uh, establishing standards of practice for medical health officers, working with the BC Centre for Disease Control. And so in a provincial state of emergency, which we are in now, the provincial health officer can make orders as needed and you must follow those orders. So WorkSafe BC has been working very closely with the provincial health office and the BC CDC in all of the protocols that, uh, that I'm going to be talking about and how the two systems are working together. So, and I'll provide some examples later of where complaints may come in that may be resolved by WorkSafe BC or WorkSafe BC may be turning those complaints over to public health, depending on whether the issue is worker health and safety or public health and safety. So I just wanted to be clear that there was that distinction between the, the two different systems within the province. So talking a little bit about COVID-19 health and safety responsibilities in particular. So overall, we have general health and safety responsibilities. So as an employer, it's really important that you understand your responsibility to provide a healthy and safe workplace. And there are some basic responsibilities. So providing workers with prompt, easily accessible and appropriate first aid treatment, managing risk in your workplace, having a health and safety program and, and the health and safety committee if your workplace has more than 20 workers, performing regular workplace inspections, ensuring that all workers are properly trained and oriented to do their work safely, and reporting serious incidents to WorkSafe BC and carrying out an incident investigation. So those are the, the general health and safety responsibilities that have existed since the, uh, the inception of WorkSafe BC in, in 1917. Those aren't COVID specific, those are just the, the general responsibilities. But when it comes to COVID, employers, workers, owners or prime contractors, and other people in the workplace also have a responsibility to prevent exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace. So the general health and safety that principles that apply do apply to COVID-19 as well. So for COVID-19 specifically, an employer's responsibility is to complete and post the COVID-19 safety plan. So the provincial health office made an order that every employer must have a health and safety plan, a COVID-19 health and safety plan. So that was a provincial health order and it's WorkSafe BC that's following up. And I'll talk more about how we're following up on those safety plans. Uh, the employer is responsible for training and providing education on the contents of that plan and having a system in place to identify the hazards of COVID-19, control the risk, and monitor the effectiveness of those controls. At the same time, workers have responsibilities in our system. So the worker has a responsibility for taking reasonable care to protect their own health and safety and the health and safety of other people in the workplace. So this includes personal self-care, such as frequent hand washing and staying home when sick. The employer has a response, sorry, the worker has a responsibility to report unsafe conditions to their employer and to follow the procedures put in place by the employer to control the risks. And this is a really important one, specifically when it comes to COVID-19. So if an employer has put procedures for the workplace in place, then the employees, the workers, must follow those procedures and, and help control the risks associated with COVID-19. Now, one of the things that we get asked is about refusing unsafe work. So in British Columbia, workers have the right to refuse unsafe work if they believe that it presents an undue hazard. So an undue hazard is an unwarranted, inappropriate, excessive, or disproportionate hazard. So for COVID-19, this is where a worker's role places them at increased risk of exposure 
and adequate controls are not in place to protect them from that exposure. So if that's the situation, the worker should follow steps first within their workplace to resolve the issue. So the worker would begin by reporting the undue hazard to their employer for investigation. If the matter is not resolved within the workplace, then the worker and the supervisor or the employer must contact WorkSafe BC and a prevention officer will investigate and take steps to find a workable solution. So I'll give you an, an example uh, of how this process worked. At the beginning of COVID-19, of course, there was a lot of uncertainty. Retail stores weren't mandated to shut down. Many retail stores stayed open, but they weren't sure about the protocols and processes that they had to have in place. So there was a small bakery and uh, the workers reported to WorkSafe BC that they wanted to refuse work because they felt that it was unsafe, unsafe work. They felt that there was an undue hazard being presented to them. A WorkSafe BC prevention officer investigated and found that the employer had actually put a number of controls in place. So they had a safety plan, they had erected barriers so that there was a physical barrier. They were limiting the occupancy of the number of people who could come into the bakery. All appropriate measures were in place. So in that circumstance, the prevention officer deemed that it was appropriate for those workers to go back to work. So that's just one example of that right to refuse process and how it, it may be resolved. I also wanted to talk a little bit about how to develop the COVID-19 safety plan to control the risk of exposure in the workplace. So as I mentioned, every employer is required by the provincial health order to have a COVID-19 safety plan that assesses the risk of exposure at their workplace and implements measures to keep their workers safe. So if a formal plan is not already in place prior to operation, you're expected to develop it while protecting the safety of your workers. Now, WorkSafe BC is not reviewing and approving the plans of individual employers in advance. And if you just, if you think about the province, there are over 200,000 registered employers. So it would be physically impossible to review the plans of every single employer in advance of them resuming business or, or operating under COVID. But we would review those safety plans during a, workspace, a workplace inspection. And that would be a workplace inspection by a prevention officer. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more coming up about what to expect when a prevention officer does come to your site. So we will ask employers about the steps they've taken to protect their workers, and we'll review the safety plan developed. Now by order of the provincial health officer, your plan must be posted at your work site and on your website. So again, just mentioning that the, there were the orders of the uh, provincial health office and the BC Center for Disease Control, and really the basics of all of the, uh, the, the information that we're sharing in the safety plans, first is maintaining that physical distancing. So that's the, the first level of control that we want to put in place, adequate cleaning and disinfecting, and personal hygiene. And, and now that we're a number of months into COVID, you'll see you know, those messages have been reinforced through all kinds of different public awareness campaigns. So the steps in creating a COVID-19 plan are really first off to assess the risk in your workplace. So where do people congregate? Where are work processes um, having a number of people working together? Where can we adjust those work processes so that people aren't coming within that two meters of distance from each other? So implementing measures to reduce the risk and, and uh, physical barriers are an example and we've seen many examples of those where there's not a possibility of maintaining that two meters, so a physical barrier has been erected um, in, instead. Developing policies to manage your workplace, so having policies, for example, that people are not to come to work if they're exhibiting any symptoms of COVID-19. Developing communications plans and, and training and ensuring that all of your workers are aware of the responsibilities that they have around COVID-19 and the procedures that they must follow monitoring your workplace and updating your plans as needed and of course you know information is evolving in terms of COVID-19 and our understanding of the disease and transmission and so on so uh, you have to ensure that you're monitoring the most recent information in your workplace and updating your plans as required and then assessing and addressing any risks from resuming operations so there were a number of businesses that were actually shut down for a number of months and so part of the COVID-19 safety protocols 
were determining if there were any undue risks or hazard as a result of reopening. So had any machinery shut down, for example, for, for three months that all of a sudden was going to start resuming operations and were there any hazards associated with that machinery resuming operations. That's just a, a very quick highlight of the six steps that are involved in creating a COVID-19 safety plan. There is a COVID-19 safety plan template uh, at worksafebc.com. It's a fillable template. You're not required to use this template. We have just provided this as a guide. Uh, organizations can come up with their own safety plan, but we'll be looking for the basic information that's covered in this template. There's also a mobile app version now available of the template so that you can, uh, you can fill it in on your mobile device as well. So when it came to uh, guiding industry back to work or to the resumption of work, we developed what are called industry specific protocols. And these are recommendations and best practices. So they're not requirements, so they are not you must, but they're recommendations and best practices. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Sorry, I just had a. Sounds like Teams. Sorry, yes. Is my screen still sharing? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry about that. Um, so, my industry, so talking about industry specific protocols are recommendations and not requirements. And so, an example, one of the first sets of industry protocols that we worked on were for the film industry. And the film industry often has catering on site. And so, one of the recommendations was providing pre packaged meals for cast members rather than any kind of buffet or self service option. So, again, it wasn't a requirement, they were just recommendations and best practices. So WorkSafe BC worked to develop industry specific protocols for all of the phase one, uh, according to the government, the phase one industries and phase two and three industries. So you'll see a, a not a comprehensive list, but um, a, a number of the uh, industry specific protocols that were developed. And these protocols really were developed in conjunction with industry. So we worked with the various industries to see what was practicable in those industries. And then we worked with the provincial health office to make sure that these protocols were aligned with the direction and the intent uh, coming from the provincial health office. So what to expect from prevention? So there are approximately 300 prevention officers uh, in the province uh, of British Columbia, and they have um, inspection protocols. So they will go out to employers and do inspections. Prior to COVID-19, the focus of many of our inspections was on those high-risk industries, so construction, manufacturing, forestry, and it would be quite rare that some of the lower-risk industries, what we typically think of as lower-risk industries, retail, hospitality, law firms, things like that, would actually be visited by a prevention officer. Well, that changed with COVID-19 because we recognize that the risk of COVID-19 exists in all of those workplaces and, and in fact can be an increased risk in, in some of those workplaces such as retail and hospitality. So prevention officer visits are happening around the province to a number of different types of, of businesses. So if you get a visit from an officer, I, again, I go back to the first message that I started this presentation with, they really are, are coming at this from a consultative and, and educative process. So they'll be asking you about the process you use to develop your plan, and they'll work with you on how to assess how effectively the plan controls the COVID-19 risk. So they'll give you feedback on your plan and how you can, how you can improve that plan if necessary. Uh, the officer will provide an inspection report with details about the inspection. The officer will issue orders if they identify health and safety violations requiring correction, and they'll outline the steps that need to be corrected, and then the officer will follow up as needed. Orders are meant to be instructive and corrective in nature and will not impact your insurance premiums. Now, there are also penalties. So employers who commit health and safety violations may receive administrative penalties. These are monetary fines. These fines are to help motivate employers to comply with health and safety requirements. So WorkSafe BC may impose penalties on employers for any of the following. Failing to take sufficient precautions to prevent work-related injury or illness, not complying with the occupational health and safety regulation, 
in the provisions of the Workers' Compensation Act or an applicable order, or having an unsafe workplace and or working conditions. So a penalty will not be imposed if the employer established that it exercised due diligence. In other words, if the employer shows that it took all reasonable care to prevent the violation. So again, WorkSafe BC really focuses on education and consultation with employers. Imposing penalties is not the current focus. There is an appeal process, both for orders and for penalties. So there are two levels for review and appeal. Reviews are conducted by internal and impartial review division, including decisions to impose an order or to impose a penalty. Requests for a review of health and safety enforcement decisions must be submitted to the review division within 45 days after the decision. Appeals are also conducted by an external independent appeals tribunal known as the Workers' Compensation Appeal Trib Tribunal, or WCAT. Most decisions of the review division may be appealed to WCAT within 30 days. So if you get an order and you want to appeal it, you have 45 days to appeal it with the review division. If you get a decision from the review division, you have 30 days to appeal it um, with WCAT. And you can get free independent advice from the employer's advisor's office. So the employer's advisor's office is separate and distinct from WorkSafe BC and provides employers with advice on how to manage the system. Now, I wanted to give all of this a little bit of context. So in terms of COVID, WorkSafe BC so far has received over 14,000 inquiries. And these inquiries range from, you know, how do I put safety protocols in place? Should I be doing A, not B? Um, I've seen, I've been to a workplace and they're doing A, not B, you know, all those types of inquiries. So about 14,000 of those. We've conducted 2,600 consultations with employers. So when COVID started and when the industry protocols were released, uh, we had teams of people reaching out, um, and most of this was done virtually, reaching out with employers to help advise them, letting them know that the protocols were in place, uh, answering any questions that they might have about how to create that safety plan. So far, our prevention officers have done almost 15,000 inspections. And within the scope of all of those inspections, they've only issued 420 orders. So relative to the number of inspections, that's a very low number of orders. And really that's just a reflection of the fact that the majority of employers in the province have an understanding of what their requirement is and are doing their best to implement protocols, right? We've had a very positive back to employers and employers really want to be doing as much as they can to prevent the transmission of, of COVID. So we've only had 420 orders and we've issued no penalties related to COVID so far. So I, I thought that that sort of data would give a bit of a perspective on all of the things that I've talked about. So of course, you know, there's fear of penalties, but I, again, some perspective, there have been zero penalties um, in 14,000 inspections that we've conducted to date. So just a, a little bit in terms of WorkSafe BC's support, there are a, a huge wealth of online resources that have been developed uh, for COVID-19. And uh, I'm happy to share this presentation, Ronald. I don't know if you can, uh, Arnold, I don't know if you can um, post it online, but uh, all the links are here. But worksafebc.com is the main landing page. And we have a number of resources that are available in different languages. So simplified Chinese, traditional, uh, French, Punjabi, and Spanish. And I really wanted to point out this prevention information line. So both workers and employers can to a prevention officer to get answers to their questions. And so this is the, uh, the WorkSafe BC number that's being promoted around the province. Um, we also have a number of customers that call the WorkSafe BC line. And uh, in some cases, those customers' questions can re be resolved by WorkSafe BC. And in some places, those customer questions are more uh, around public health and safety than they are around worker health and safety. And so those get directed to the provincial health office. And just finally, some additional resources. Uh, there are some links to the BC Centre for Disease Control, the Office of the Provincial Health Office, and the information around uh, 811 and um, the, the COVID-19 non-medical information line. So that wraps it up for, for my presentation. And uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for listening and uh, look forward to questions and, and answers. And I do have my contact information on this presentation, and I would be happy if anybody followed up with me directly afterwards if they had a specific question that they wanted to ask offline. Thank you. 
Excellent. Trudy, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us. I think that it would be traditional in a live setting for people to clap. So let's give a little round of applause for uh, Trudy. I think she did an excellent job. I guess in, in, uh, in the virtual setting, it looks like that. Um, but, uh, you know, give her, give her a little round of applause. I thought that was an excellent um, outline for, um, you know, what, what it takes or what's important. Um, now, Jyoti, I just want to thank you, Kendra, uh, for uh, doing the reaction. Uh, just, Jyoti, I wanted to uh, throw it over to you uh, for a minute because I know that, um, obviously, from a complaint perspective, uh, WorkSafe only uh, deals with employers and employees. And so, um, if um, a customer was going to get sick or go, can you tell us a bit about what that process would look like from um, from a public? Uh, potentially making a complaint against your business or your organization, uh, what that would look like? Yes, definitely. Thank you, Arnold, for having me today. Um, and thank you very much for everyone, everybody that's joining today. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to prepare a formal presentation, um, but I do want to set out uh, some of the processes that uh, you would have to take part in if a member of the public did make a complaint against you and actually went to court and sued you uh, for personal injury. Um, I'll give you some background on what I sort of do. So I primarily work with motor vehicle accidents. Um, so personal injury being caused by motor vehicle accidents. Uh, I work for ICBC and I also represent injured parties. So I'm sort of a familiar with the process of what happens when an injured party does go to court. Uh, similar to motor vehicle accidents, if someone were to get COVID as a result of a 10 year business, um, it would be considered a personal injury to them and um, they would have to establish a number of things to prove that you were negligent um, in order to actually succeed in a claim. Um, so the first thing that I wanna do today is sort of set out uh, the process in uh, provincial court and Supreme Court. So this is if you know somebody actually did come to your business, they got COVID as a result of attending your business, um, they've actually decided to take the step of going to court and suing you for negligence. Um, and they have the option to do that in either provincial court or Supreme Court um, based on what they think the monetary value of their claim is. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll set out um, the different elements of negligence that they will have to prove in order to actually succeed in a claim. And um, I think that will be helpful for you know, businesses because uh, they can sort of protect themselves and make sure that they're taking the appropriate steps when customers do come to their business and attend. Um, so first off, uh, if an individual does attend your business and, uh, you know, does get COVID, becomes severely injured as a result of that, is sick, is in the hospital, is unable to work, um, they do have the option to go and file a complaint. Um, so they can either go to the provincial court, um, and the reason they would go to the provincial court is because it is sort of a simplified process. It's for self-represented individuals. Um, and it's easy for, you know, the person making the claim to navigate and also for the person that the complaint is against to navigate um, because there are a lot of processes in place for that. So uh, an individual would likely bring a claim in small claims if they think that the monetary value of their claim is less than $35,000. Um, and that would be including of any, you know, wage losses or any time they've taken off as a result of the injury that they've sustained. Um, and if, if they think that the monetary value of their claim is more than $35,000, they would likely go to Supreme Court and sue you or your business um, for any losses that they've sustained. Um, likely that would be if they take an extended period of time off work. Um, otherwise, $35,000 usually covers, you know, a few weeks off work if that's sort of what happened as a result of the injury. The deadlines for filing documents um, for each court are different. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the provincial court is much more simplified because it is for self-represented individuals. Um, if you are sued in Supreme Court, uh, I would suggest getting a lawyer to assist you with that process just because it is much more onerous and there's many more rules that you do have to follow. Um, I'll sort of start with setting out just a general um, over, overlook of what happens in small claims court and uh, the different forms that have to be filled out and the initial steps that you do have to take if you are sued in small claims court. Uh, so the beginning, the first thing is that somebody would likely come and serve a notice of claim on you. 
Uh, once that's actually served on you, you have 14 days to file a reply in the provincial court. If you don't do so, uh, the other party can go to the courts and get a default judgment against you, and you don't want that. Um, the, the reply to the notice of claim is a very simple document. Um, you don't need to put any uh, evidence in that document. You just need to set out your position um, and how you intend to protect yourself moving forward. Um, once you file that reply, the courts typically set something called a settlement conference. Um, and what that is, is an opportunity for you to sit with the other party, hear them out, um, you know, hear what they have to say. In, in these sorts of circumstances, it would likely be, you know, when did they attend your business? What day was that? And then you can look through your records if you have any logs of uh, the different people that were attending to first of all establish whether that person was even at your business on that day. Um, and how they would have likely uh, gone COVID from attending your, your premises. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to sit down with the judge and hopefully put the matter to bed. Um, and if you're not able to do that, then what happens in small claims is that um, you can either, uh, you know, you can attempt to settle it at any point with them if you just want it to go away or a trial of the matter is usually set uh, fairly quickly because uh, it's usually just a day or two trial in small claims. It's not an onerous process. On the other hand, uh, if you were to go with, you know, Supreme Court, so if the other party sues you in Supreme Court, uh, they would be serving what's called a notice of civil claim on you. Um, and what happens then is that you would have to file a response within 21 days from the date that notice of civil claim was served on you. Again, similar to small claims court, um, you uh, uh, don't want to uh, have the other party apply for a default judgment, so you have to reply within the prescribed time limits. Um, and once that happens, the parties typically exchange documents and anything else related to the claim. So you would give them what you intend to rely on. So that would be any documents of the steps that you had taken. So um, any pictures of the, the premises that you had taken, um, any notes that you keep of the different precautions you've taken to protect the people coming into your business. So everything you intend to rely on. And the other individual will do the same. So, you know, if they have documents or evidence that says, yes, I did attend your business on this day, if they have a receipt um, for attending your business on that day, they would have to prove that they actually got COVID as a result of attending your business on that day. Um, and again, any medical records related to um, any illness, ongoing illness, they have any disability from work. Um, so, so the next process would essentially be exchanging documents with each other. Um, from there on in, uh, you can also set what's called an examination for discovery, uh, which is a good opportunity for you as a business to sort of, um, you know, ask the other party questions under oath to see um, what their actual losses were uh, as a result of this and whether or not they can establish that it was because of the day that they attended your business or whatever it was. Um, so that's a very, very important step. Um, from there on in, it would go to mediation or trial. Um, there are numerous other steps that are uh, that need to be taken in Supreme Court. So I would recommend getting a lawyer to assist you with the process. Um, should you be sued in Supreme Court just because the rules are much more complex than they are in small claims court um, and they're more difficult for, for lay people to navigate through. So I would recommend um, at least consulting a lawyer um, to, to see what they can assist you with. Um, now, in order for an injured party to actually succeed in an action in either provincial court or Supreme Court, they would have to establish that you were negligent, so that you did actually did something wrong. Um, and there are different elements that they have to prove in order to prove negligence. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to set out um, sort of a, a general over overview of the different elements of negligence. Um, and I think that will help you sort of figure out how to protect yourself um, in these circumstances. Uh, so the first element uh, of negligence is that the injured person must establish that the at-fault party owed the injured person a duty of care. So a duty of care is actually just sort of a special relationship and it's the first element required by to prove negligence. Um, so typically in, in a business sort of setting, you know, somebody coming into your store or coming into your restaurant 
would quite easily establish a duty of care. So I don't think that would be too difficult for the injured party to establish. The first element is typically the easiest and likely they would have already established that before actually starting a claim against you. The second, and I think the most important uh, element, especially for these circumstances is that it must be established that the negligent party's conduct fell below the standard of care. Um, and I say that's important because, especially in circumstances such as COVID, um, uh, for businesses, it's really important that they're following the rules and regulations set out by the province and the health officers. So uh, if you're following all of those rules and regulations, so for example, you know, you have proper signage up in front of your uh, business for, um, you have signage inside your business, you're ensuring social distancing inside your business, um, you know, if it's a restaurant or, or so that, that sort of thing, you're keeping track of the different individuals coming into your business. Um, I know a lot of businesses are doing that now and they're also taking down phone numbers. And that's actually very helpful if someone were to bring a claim against you because it's easier for you to establish who was actually in your business that day. Um, and it's easier to, to navigate in that sense. So as long as you are um, you know, following those rules and regulations uh, that the province and the health officer have set out, um, you should be able to establish that you were, were um, operating within the standard of care. The next element of negligence is that the act must cause some sort of injury. So in these circumstances, the injury would obviously be that somebody actually got COVID as a result of attending your premises or your business. Um, and the, ne the next step would be for them to establish that that injury has caused them some sort of damage. So damage in the sense that, you know, it's, uh, it's caused them to stay off work for a period of time. It's caused ongoing health concerns for them. Um, you know, they've had to get medication for this or that sort of thing. So damage can be uh, various different things. It can also just be pain and suffering from, from the, the injury. Um, so what people have to do is actually establish all of those elements in order to succeed in a claim. So whether that's in small claims or whether that's in Supreme Court. Um, so I think the most important thing is to just to protect yourself is to keep very good notes. If this matter does proceed to, let's say, a trial or a mediation, um, you need to have evidence, right? You need to have something that you can show the courts that this is what I was doing. These are the different protocols that I have at my business. Um, and if you take photos of all these things, once you have uh, put them in place in your business, you have evidence that you've taken those steps um, and uh, that will help you moving forward um, with all of this. Um, and Arnold, if uh, anyone else has any questions, we can sort of go from there and yeah. I think that's great. And I think that ultimately, you know, what we see is you know, when and Trudy laid out what we need to have in place in terms of the plan, in terms of the training, in terms of the, you know, the signage. I think all <laughs> those things really play a role. And hopefully what um, people are getting from this is the importance of actually doing those things, because then there is, if there is something, then you can, you have something to point to. Uh, one question I have for both Trudy and Jyoti, uh, I've got a couple, but one is, um, it's hard to control people. If you are an employer, for example, and you're mandating physical distancing or the wearing of masks or not too many people in the lunchroom and your employees aren't listening, um, uh, what, uh, or vice versa, if you are asking people to be physically distanced in your store and or, and or wear a mask if you're inside or, or not attend, uh, where is, um, I'm just, and this is not probably an answerable question, but I just wanna facilitate the discussion what is the responsibility, uh, Trudy, from the employer's perspective if your employees aren't following the protocols or policies you have in place? What would be um, an expectation of an inspection officer uh, if they were to attend a complaint uh, from one of the other employees um, uh, from a managing people perspective? Right, okay, so I mean, it is an interesting question, but as we've outlined, workers are responsible for following the procedures that are set out by their employer. So this is actually a, a documented responsibility of workers. So as the employer, I mean, you have the ability to go back and say to your, your staff, you know, this is one of your responsibilities to follow these things. Now, 
there's just like any other behavior, there's a disciplinary process that they could use. You know, if a, if a worker wasn't following the policies and procedures not related to COVID, it would be the same kind of process that they would follow. In extreme measures, uh, there is something called an order to worker. So you can contact WorkSafe BC, talk to a prevention officer. Um, they could come out and, and write order to workers. There have been no order to workers written when it comes to COVID-19 to date. Um, you know, these are exceptional circumstances and the, the best one I can, I can think of is where uh, workers were, you know, involved in horseplay using a forklift. Um, you know, they had training, the employer had documented all the training, the employer had very clear, clear procedures around not engaging in horseplay and the workers were still engaging in a horseplay with, 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 with a forklift, which is obviously a very dangerous activity. So that, that circumstance resulted in an order to the workers. Um, but it's quite rare. So I think, you know, as an employer, you need to use the typical uh, disciplinary coaching, whatever format that you would use when it comes to non-COVID related procedures that employees have to follow in your, the general health and safety of, of the workplace. Yeah, and because I'm, I'm imagining the, yes, they have that in place, they've got all the signage, but it's kind of just lip service, they're not really enforcing it. So, uh, I mean, so one employee might say, I just, I don't feel safe or, you know, it's the, the employer's not. So I, I'm just wondering, has there been any uh, conversation around that? Sorry, where an employee doesn't feel safe that the employer is not following the procedures they've set out? Yes, well, you know, like the employer set out the procedures, they've done the training, they've asked everybody to do it, but they're kind of lax in enforcing it. And I'm just wondering, um, uh, so it sounds like what you're saying, and maybe I'll answer my own question, is that as long, like it's important for the uh, employer to take action if that is the case, to, to make sure uh, as much as the worker is responsible for following, it's also to the responsibility of the employer to make sure that if a worker isn't following, to go into that disciplinary process of, you know, making sure that they're being addressed. Would that be accurate? Like if, if it came down to, um, you know, I guess proving negligence, and maybe Jody, that's something you can speak to as well, that the employer just didn't take any action to keep, make sure their employees were doing what they're supposed to do. So there, there are responsibilities on both sides. The employer has a responsibility of developing the plan, implementing the plan, and monitoring it. So they, they can't you know, just sort of lax off, develop the plan, and then not monitor it. They, they have a responsibility to be monitoring that plan. Workers have the responsibility to be following the procedures set out. If either party is falling behind, so this would be where a worker could refuse unsafe work, right? That could be an example where they say, you know, the employer has these policies in place, but the employer isn't actually following their own policies. Mm. That would be a conversation they would have with their employer first, and then they could have with WorkSafe BC, and WorkSafe BC could follow up. Um, you know, accordingly, the same goes if the, um, the worker is not following the policies and procedures. The employer has a responsibility to use whatever process that they have in place internally to make sure that the workers do follow that process. And Jody, what do you think, like, so uh, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, I'm not wearing a mask, uh, you can't make me, you know, that whole idea of customers coming into your store. Um, what, because also you don't want to be unsafe because people can lash out. So I'm just wondering, obviously it's a fine line and, and maybe there's not a great answer, but what would you recommend to be a, a, a good practice for employers um, or a, a business owners who have customers who aren't following protocol um, in order to make sure that they um, they aren't a sued by someone else that may have been in that store yeah um, i think what similar to what trudy said about the employer and the employee relationship um, the employer needs to definitely monitor that the employees are taking all of these steps um, and similar to that if somebody does enter your business it's your responsibility to monitor whether they're actually social distancing within your business, whether it's a store and they're maintaining that distance, whether they're actually wearing their masks. Um, putting up a sign outside is different from, you know, actually asking someone to put on a mask if they're refusing to do so. Um, and I've seen this firsthand at a nail salon where somebody refused to wear a mask. And at that point, um, the owner of the business asked the person to leave. Um, I think that would be, you know, the initial conversation that you have with the person attending the business is that if you refuse to take these steps, um, we would ask you to leave. Um, obviously, I know that you could be putting yourself in a harmful situation if you do do that. Um, having a security guard nearby would be great or in the 
circumstances, you call the police if you feel like it's not a safe environment. But I think setting out those procedures and actually following up with, with the, the patrons and uh, the customers that come into your business is very, very important um, in order to protect yourself. Even if this matter moves forward and someone were to bring a claim against you, if you could establish that, yes, you had everything in place, but they didn't follow these rules, that will definitely help you in discontinuing the claim or um, you know, getting rid of it altogether. I just wanted to, to add, I think that's a great response and, and really to acknowledge this is a very challenging time for both employers and workers. They've never had this sort of challenge of dealing with the public who may not want to follow the rules that have been set up in place. And so we have a number of young workers right now that are being bullied and harassed by customers who don't want to sit at two tables because their party's bigger than six or, you know, don't want to put on a mask or whatever it may be. So it's really a, a challenging time for employers and we're even having conversations you know as an employer you have a responsibility to maintain that social distancing in your premise but what about the lineup that's happening outside your premise like how far this extend and, and this is a new area for all of us and we're all you know learning and developing in this capacity so i think it keep coming, be kind, be calm, be safe. And, and that's certainly, you know, what we're hoping for out of, out of customer. Yeah, I think, uh, Tr Trudy, I think we're just uh, uh, losing you a little bit. Uh, I, I didn't, I thought it would come back, um, but uh, we had, uh, we lost you uh, a little bit in the middle of that. But I, I agree, it's an incredibly difficult situation where you're put in a conflict with your customers and to ask them to do that. But I think that what I heard both of you say, Ajoti, is that, you know, if you don't do that, if you don't take a stand against your customers, then potentially that someone else could in your store could say, yeah, they, this person came in, wasn't following the rules um, and, they, and they didn't do anything about it. Uh, and so they put me at risk by not taking responsibility. Is that, is that accurate, Ajoti? I think that pretty much sounds right. Um, you know, it's your responsibility to protect the customers that are coming into uh, your premises. So um, obviously, you can't force somebody to do something. So if if a different if an individual that enters your business is putting others at risk, um, all you can do at that stage is ask that person to leave. Um, and should some sort of conflict actually arise from that, I think the next step would be to call the police if if that's what sort of happens. Right. Yeah. I, I, and so that's, I mean, that's really interesting. What an incredibly, as you say, Trudy, an incredibly difficult position to put people in. I mean, ultimately, I think that that's, um, you know, as a, as a community, um, if we can continue to encourage each other as our neighbors and as our friends and as our, and, and just to, you know, remind each other to be kind and be safe, as you said, Trudy, or just to really um, understand that this is difficult for everybody. Uh, and add that extra piece of patience. I think that would make a big difference. Um, does anybody have any specific questions? I can tend to be dominating these things. I've only asked uh, for uh, Trudy and Jody to be available till uh, 1245. Uh, Carly, I, I see your hand up and you did it in the physical sense. And so I think that's even better than the technology sense. So go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask a question um, uh, to uh, our, uh, our experts here. Am I on now? You are. Great, thank you. I actually put it in the chat, but I don't know if anybody looked there. So I just teach sewing classes from my home, so it's not an employer-employee thing. My employee actually is not gonna come back. Um, but I'm gonna be seeing four adults at a time. So I can separate them all and you know, do, do a, you know, the disinfectant and we're all gonna wear masks, that type of thing. But am I advised to have them sign a waiver? That they, like a hold harmless agreement? Yeah, so this is actually a discussion we've had various times in our own office, whether or not, um, you know, it's a good idea to get an agreement signed for COVID. Um, and we've sort of been bouncing ideas off each other. And a lot of businesses have started to do this just to protect themselves um, and just to, to make sure that the other party knows of the risks that there that are you know, can present themselves, can present in the situation. So I never think it's a bad idea to sign an agreement. How that will hold up in court really depends. Um, at this point, none of these claims have actually gotten to court for COVID, but it never hurts to get an agreement signed. 
um, just because it puts it in writing. It sets out that you have shared your concerns with the other party and they've signed it, so they've seen it. Um, so definitely don't, don't think it's harmless in any sort of way. Thanks, Jody. Carly, did I, did I get your question answered? Excellent. Uh, I had one question for uh, Trudy, um, and it was with regards to uh, when there's a recommendation and they kind of conflict with uh, the standards or the, I guess, the duty of care. So, for example, you talked about the film industry and they have craft services and they usually have a, a table that you can go to and, and but they're recommended to have individual servings. It seems to me that someone could come along and say, you know, um, that you're not following the recommendations or that recommendation uh, should be a standard. Uh, has there been any um, uh, any updating of the standards as you've gone along? Like any of these recommendations kind of turned into standards based on feedback from the public or employers or employees? No, I, I think Trudy might be frozen here. Uh, not sure. Uh, obviously, it's lunchtime and everybody's uh, at to work safe is now um, uh, using their t internet or something. I don't know. Um, so, Trudy, uh, hopefully you'll come back in a minute. Uh, Jyoti, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, I, I, I think I froze up for a second there, too. Or maybe I froze up. Can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you right now. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, so, the question really is, um, when does the recommendation become a responsibility? So a recommendation from, let's say, if it was WCB or a different organization? Uh, yes. Um, so, for example, Trudy talked about recommendations to the film industry, but it seems like sometimes those recommendations would kind of turn into obligations or, you know, or responsibilities. And so I'm just curious about that. Now we're just at the end. So Jody, I don't know if you uh, can jump on there, but uh, what, any thoughts on that? I think if it, when it comes to protecting the health of, you know, whether it's an employee or whether it's a customer, I think right then it becomes a responsibility. So whether it's somebody that you work with or your customers, if, if it's something that may affect, you know, um, whether or not they, you know, get COVID from attending at your, your business or your place of work, I think at that same place, it becomes a responsibility. So I do think um, it's kind of works hand in hand. And one last thing, I think we lost Trudy. I'm so glad she had her here. But um, so people are asking about waivers, but a waiver doesn't necessarily protect you against negligence. Is that accurate? It is accurate. It is accurate to an extent. Um, what it helps with is it helps set out the risks that the individual is putting themselves in by attending, whether it's your residence or whether it's your place of business. So it, it does set out to them that they've read it, they understand the risk that they're at. But if you don't follow the rules that are put in place right now by the province and the health officer, you can still be held liable for these things. Right. So the, the waiver is a, um, would help you in that case, would help you um, say like, hey, they knew what they were getting into. They knew how they were going to proceed, but it doesn't necessarily ultimately you can go, okay, great. Now I don't have to do anything. You still have to have the, the right duty of care. It looks like we've got Trudy back uh, to say thank you and goodbye. So, um, hey, you know what? I just want to say uh, a thanks to uh, everyone uh, for being here today. Uh, I think that was a really valuable discussion. Uh, can I just get a, um, uh, just a thumbs up uh, if you found that valuable? Um, and if you think this information was helpful, thank you, Carly. Um, and Trudy, so, welcome back. No, hey, Ronald, yeah, I, I think I had an internet connection or something. I, I've come back in. I hope I didn't miss anything, but I do encourage anybody to reach out to me directly, uh, and I'll be happy to follow up. Great. I'm just getting lots of thumbs up. Uh, Trudy, I just want to say thank you very much for being here. I thought your presentation was excellent. Um, uh, you did a great job. And uh, uh, Jyoti, same. Uh, I think that it, this was really helpful to understand, you know, really, what are your obligations? Don't get too lax out there. Uh, you know, even though it kind of feels like we're going back to normal, um, you want to make sure that you're protected and doing uh, and following your responsibilities as set out by the public health officer and by WorkSafe. Um, so thank you uh, very much for taking the time to be here. Uh, I am two minutes over time and I don't like to take people's time without, without permission. So um, thanks again. Hopefully you can join us next week um, at Trudy. Uh, again, thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, we'll we'll talk to you all very soon.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.